Uh, this is your host, Burgess Foster at City Desk, a show about what's trending in Metro Detroit. We style it the Community Conversation Channel. Boy, is there a lot to talk about this morning on Wednesday, the day after the Michigan primary and the Mississippi primary. As you may have heard, Bernie Sanders pulled off the upset. As a matter of fact, my headlines read, upset in Michigan, not Bernie Sanders. <laughs> that would be Hillary Clinton upset in Michigan, not Bernie Sanders. She did win Mississippi quite handily though. I mean, she actually gave him a shellacking actually, uh, to be quite honest, down in Mississippi. I think she polled in almost 90% of the vote. Uh, I know it was over 80%. And it's amazing how the African-American vote has really been pivotal, pivotal in the Secretary Clinton's campaign, without which she would not have been victorious in the South at all, especially South Carolina and Mississippi. And by the way, for some of you out there who may not know your history or your African-American history, Mississippi and South Carolina were two states during Reconstruction in which African Americans elected U.S. Senators and Congressmen directly after the Civil War because those two states had a predominant number of African Americans living there. And we're seeing a little bit of percolation or a little bit of rising to the top of that historical fact still lingering in that area. Uh, of the Southeast United States. So what does this basically mean going forward? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that Hillary Clinton does not have a lock on the nomination. She does not have a lock on the nomination. What does it mean for Bernie Sanders? It means he's alive. It means he's fighting for another political day. It also means that on the next upcoming primary uh, for states ha that have not voted yet, that is quite possible, quite possible, that he could be edging up not only into single digits, which he is now. He, Hillary Clinton was leading by double digits. She's no longer leading, according to polls, by double digits any longer. It could be that Bernie Sanders could forge ahead. It would be interesting to see in August if they're willing to work together, and they should be, because it would really be a travesty, and I believe that the Republicans could actually win without both of them being on the same team. In other words, if Bernie Sanders won, and if Hillary Clinton did not take the vice presidential nod, it would cause her constituency, her followers, not to come out to the polls. It could collapse Bernie Sanders' campaign into a loss in the presidential election and the general election. And similarly, as my algebra instructor used to say, the same thing could happen for Hillary Clinton. She could go forward as the nominee and if Bernie Sanders would not take the vice presidential nod, it would cause his followers and his constituency not to come to the polls and collapse Hillary's campaign and allow the Republicans to win. But let me tell you, a united front, a house not divided for the Democrats, and it will actually be a blowout come November. A fortified, united front in November of both Clinton and Sanders. And I say it that way because alphabetically, Clinton comes before Sanders. <laughs> there would be a more formidable tie that binds. Also, 
I was thinking and I was speaking to the fiance last night and I explained to her that Hillary Clinton is on a historical path if she's vice president or president. There has never been a female vice president, Bishop, ever. There's never been a female president, ever. So Hillary Clinton makes history either way. At least that's the sizzle on the steak that I'm smelling. You know, when that steak is sizzling, when it's, you know, just about to come to the plate, you can sense the salivation and I can sense the salivation of victory for the Democrats. Now, I don't believe that Hillary and Sanders together can lose. I just don't. Give us a call at 313-871-6094. I was out yesterday uh, passing out some business cards, some greeting cards to some of the voters, introducing myself as their candidate in the Michigan House District 3 at some of the polling sites. So I got a chance to get out and meet a few hundred people yesterday. And I tell you, the outlook for me gets better and better every single day. I met many people at the polling sites yesterday. As a matter of fact, I think the polling numbers, I'm, I'm waiting to hear what those are, but uh, I believe they're going to be low, but better than expected, if that makes any sense. I'm expecting the polling numbers to come in right around what I said, about 30%. Last night, uh, it's better than expected because um, two years ago in the 2014 campaign that I ran for U.S. Congress, the turnout was about 18 to 20%. And I believe this year, a presidential election year, will have something to do with the numbers being a little bit better. I had said before, I had said before that I did not think that the numbers would be as equally as good due to the fact that we didn't have President Barack Obama in the race. But let me tell you, Bishop, I do believe that we're going to have a better than 50% voter turnout in this presidential election but less than 68%. I believe that's going to bode well for the Democrats. Give us a call, 313-871-6094. You know, there's a big need for increased funding and faith based organizations. Remember at one time, prior to 2000, prior to George Bush Jr. getting in office, churches really couldn't apply for federal grant funding because it was seen as a overreach in the separation of church and state. But when President Bush got in, he increased funding for faith-based organizations, and I think rightfully so. Many of the faith-based organizations, Bishop, as you know, um, really fill the void and they stand in the gap for a lot of nonprofits um, that just don't have the capacity. They stand in the gap for the corporations whose mission doesn't align with greater social responsibility. That's one of the 
platform planks, if you will, that I will be shooting for even as a state representative in Lansing in 2017. Increase funding for faith-based organizations uh, from the state, if you will, that would allow them in some kind of creative way, maybe through taxation or lack of taxation, uh, more of an opportunity to do uh, specifically housing development and supplemental educational services. Please give us a call this morning at City Desk. I'm your host, Burgess Foster, candidate for the Michigan House in District 3. That's north and south from 6 Mile to 8 Mile, from 8 Mile to 6 Mile, and from Livinois at the far western point to Gratiot. And in some instances, uh, we go just south of 6 Mile over to Grove, which is just you know, maybe a couple of streets. Reach out to us on the air at 313-871-6094. I met some parents last night out with their children. Uh, I met someone, a young man, who was, I believe, maybe in fourth grade, maybe fifth grade, and he had received a Detroit City Council Award for receiving a 4.0 uh, for his academic career. And I wanted to have him on the show. I wanted to you know, talk to him and, and see if he's smarter than a fourth grader and uh, give you all a chance to uh, hear some of the young talent in the city of Detroit. I'm going to be sponsoring Bishop coming up, something called Student of the Week where I'm actually going to be going out and getting a nominee from principals uh, for Students of the Week in grades 3 through 12. And then I will attempt to do a phone interview with them and allow that phone interview to be played here for a minute or two so you get a chance to have an audience, if you will, with our human resource talent of the future in the Detroit Public School District and the EAA schools. Although I am a fan and an employee of the Detroit Public School District, as of today, the EAA does have our students in it. And although there is a dichotomy, if you will, um, pitting EAA against DPSD, the students are right in the middle of that fray, a fray, and I don't want to overlook any EAA students as well. We just want to acknowledge the best and the brightest that the city of Detroit has to offer. And so I got a chance to meet some wonderful amazing parents that were bringing their children out to the polling sites. I was so pleased, well pleased, as the Lord says, with these parents, Bishop. Uh, they were just, um, you know, really adamant about demonstrating to their children the proper way to be productive citizens. So be looking out for that in the future, the segment on student of the week. Now, as we take a look at the city and some of the things that we need, we are in dire need, Bishop, of small businesses in this city. I mean, it is the backbone. I've, I've alluded to it before, but that's one of the magnets that the city desperately needs in order to regain its stature of old. We need to have businesses down Wyoming, down Schaefer, down Myers, down Greenfield, down Southfield, down Evergreen. 
more down Livinois all the way to Tyreman from 8 Mile down to Quinder down Mound down Ryan down Sherwood down Van Dyke and down Gratiot we need these streets also to be newly paved. Who's going to come and open up a small business? I learned that from Brenda Lawrence, Congressman, Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. We were in a debate and she said that she was in, in conversation with some companies that wanted to come to Southfield. You know, Southfield's a beautiful city, has a lot of corporate clients. And she said that um, it was hard for her to retain and to attract new clients corporate clients to the city when the infrastructure was crumbling. The state has to do something about these roads. County government has to do something about county roads. And the city has to do something about these side streets. I was coming up Nevada, Bishop, uh, East Nevada. It goes from Woodward all the way back up to Van Dyke. It ends at Van Dyke right by Perfecting Church. And let me tell you, the portion between I-75 going westward, just up to Woodward, is as if you were in Beirut and you had cluster bombs going off everywhere. I mean, your car could actually disappear. We need to do something about these roads, county, city, and state. We need to get together, pool the money together, actually, which would be a smart thing to do and work together systematically and have these civil engineers carve out a way, especially side streets that go from Woodward to Van Dyke. Nevada has to be redone. It has to be. Nevada has to be done. And if I'm not mistaken, Nevada is a city road, a city street. You know, if it's a, if it's, if it's a city street, then it needs to be fixed by the city. If it's a county road, it needs to be fixed by the county. If it's a state road, it needs to be fixed by the state. So we need to do something about these roads because we can't attract the small businesses, Bishop, to the city of Detroit without the infrastructure being fixed. It's, it's like putting the cart before the horse. Nobody wants to come out